Good evening. Once again, Kenny Jacobs from Bloomington, Illinois. Going to do another video this evening talking about current events as it relates to Bible prophecy. And again, I have a lot of things that I really want to cover tonight. Uh, but before I get into some news stories, I want to do a little bit of uh, discussion about the, the rapture of the church. Again, if you're, if you're, if you're new to my channel, um, I am a firm pre-tribulation rapture believer. Uh, if you're very new uh, to Bible prophecy, that is when the, the Lord will return in the air to uh, raise the dead Christians. And then the, the, lot, the Christians who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the Lord in the air to meet the Lord in the air and go back to heaven. And John 14, 1 through 3 talks about uh, he would take us back to the uh, to heaven where, where the mansions are that he's prepared for us. He says, I've gone to prepare a place for you in the Father's house. And he's going to come and, and take us back there. That's uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses uh, 15 through 18, the rapture of the church. And there's a, you know, a lot of disagreement on the timing of that. But I've studied it for 30 years, and I just it does not make any sense to me to be anywhere other than prior to the tribulation period. And So I'm going to get into a little bit of uh, discussion on that. Um, and, you know, again, because I do these videos, I get comments all the time. People try and tell me I'm wrong or I'm a heretic or preaching a false gospel. And because I'm believing in a pre-tribulation rapture, I'm not going to be ready to, uh, and be strong enough in my faith to, uh, to face the coming persecution. But uh, and, then, and then you get this all the time. The pre-tribulation rapture was invented in the 1800s by John Darby. No one ever talked about it before that. Uh, and you get people blaming C.I. Schofield, saying C.I. Schofield, in his in his in his Bible, um, created the pre-tribulation rapture. I get this one all the time. The pre-tribulation rapture is a lie that the Jesuits created, and the reasoning for that just makes zero sense whatsoever. And their reasoning is that the Jesuits came up with the pre-tribulation rapture, be, uh, because people thought that the Pope was the Antichrist, and so they came up with the pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, to counteract that, well, that makes no sense for several reasons. One, there's a start, there's a darn good chance the Pope is the Antichrist or the false prophet, and uh, I do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Secondly, the Catholic Church never discusses Bible prophecy whatsoever, period, and they don't believe in the rapture. And third, the Catholic Church would not be for a pre-tribulation rapture because. That would absolutely blow out of the water their whole theory on or doctrine, false doctrine of purgatory. If the if the Lord is going to raise the dead in Christ, and then call up the remaining saved, born again Christians, the bride of Christ, who are still alive into the air, meet the Lord and go into heaven, purgatory doesn't fit into that anywhere. So the Catholic Church definitely does not believe in the rapture. Nor have I ever, and I, grew, I went to 12 years of Catholic school, and never once was that doctor never discussed, um, period. And uh, so the, so what I want to do first of all is I want to go through a couple things. I want to, I got an article here uh, that's entitled, What Did Ancient Church Fathers Believe About the Rapture? I'm going to get into some of that here in just a minute. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the 144,000 of Revelation, the 12,000 from all 12 tribes of Israel will be sealed by, the, by God to serve and preach the gospel during the tribulation period, and they're going to be protected by God. But let's go there and, and let's look at some scripture first. Let's read uh, Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed in 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel." I'm going to make some comments about that here in just a minute, but uh, let's also go over to Revelation chapter 14. Uh, this is also verses 1 through 5. And looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, 
having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they also which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, and they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever that God would seal 144,000 uh, Jewish servants and protect them during the tribulation period, but then allow the church to be martyred and persecuted and killed during the tribulation period. That makes no sense whatsoever. We were told by Jesus and, and through the apostles several times to, to watch and be ready for an, such an hour as you think not the Son of Man comes. And it's, it's called our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are not appointed to wrath, but to obtain, but to obtain, obtain salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Now, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, there's a promise to that church right there, the church of Philadelphia, that, that they would be kept from the hour of temptation or the time period that's going to come and try the entire earth. Why would God not protect his church yet seal 144,000 Jews and protect them. That would be a direct, uh, it'd be going against this promise in Revelation 3.10 to the church. Yes, there is going to be tons of martyrs for, for Jesus Christ during the tribulation period, but those are going to be people who come to a saving knowledge of Jesus after the church is gone. Not people that were members of this, that were born again Christians and, and, and part of the bride of Christ prior to the tribulation starting. Let's look at Isaiah 57, chapter 1, excuse me, Isaiah 57, verse 1, real quick. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. It's a great picture of the rapture of the church. And and I, I look at all the all the theories and I read all the theories and, and I research it all the time and the more I research it, the more I look at it, the more I study it, the more I'm convinced that the rapture of the church is pre tribulation. I never see any good explanation for Revelation three ten from anybody who believes in the post trib rapture. John fourteen, let's go there real quick. I'm gonna try to make this Oh, i got so many things going through my head all of a sudden that I want to cover that I didn't plan on covering. Holy Spirit is moving me to talk about certain things. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, I was actually trying to figure out, by, I was trying to research and study what a post-tribulation explanation for those verses are. And here's one of the ones that came that I, I found. That, uh, well, maybe the Father's house isn't actually in heaven. What? That was a post-trib explanation for John 14, 1 through 4. I'm sorry, yes, the Father's house is in heaven, and that's where Jesus is now. He ascended to heaven in Acts chapter 1. And uh, he says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If for no one, I, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Where is Jesus at now? He's in heaven. That's where he went. He's going to come and bring his church back to heaven prior to the, the final seven-year period of time. And at the end of that period of time, when the second coming happens... The church is shown coming back with Jesus to earth for the final thousand year millennial reign of Christ. 
So, you know, again, why would he protect the 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 uh, hundred forty four thousand, but not protect the church, especially after he promised in Revelation three ten to protect the church. Um, and and I never have gotten a good explanation for this from a post trib believer either. If the church is here on earth during the tribulation period, why are they not mentioned after Revelation chapter chapter three? And why do we need the 144,000 sealed to pre preach the gospel? Why are there two witnesses preaching the gospel? Why is there an angel flying through the, the air proclaiming the gospel? If the church is here, that's what the church has always done. That's the church's great commission to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. If they were still here, we wouldn't need the two witnesses and 144,000 and the angel proclaiming the gospel. They're, 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 taking, they're, they're proclaiming the gospel now because the church is gone. All right, so let's get into some, uh, some history here. I'm going to put all these links, all these articles in the description box of this video so you can check it out yourself. But um, this is in response to some of the people who say that no one ever taught or, or believed in or preached a pre-tribulation rapture prior to John Darby in the 1800s. This article, What Did the Ancient Church Fathers Believe About the Rapture? What did the first century church fathers believe about the rapture? Were they pre-tribulation or post-tribulation? What did the disciples of the apostles of Jesus Christ teach about the rapture? And it goes on, and first of all, to talk about how uh, post-tribulation rapture people blame it all on there's an invention by John Darby. Uh, I'm going to skip over all that, and let's get to what um, some of the early church fathers said. This is Arrhenius, AD, 130 AD to 202 AD. He was a bishop of the church in Lyons, France. He was an eyewitness to the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, and a disciple of Polycarp, the first of the, of the, of the Apostle John's disciples. In his writings, he acknowledged the phrase, a time, a times, and a dividing of times in Daniel to signify the three and a half year reign of the Antichrist as the ruler of the world before the second coming of Christ. He also believed in a literal millennial reign of Christ on the earth following the second coming and the resurrection of the just. Um, but then he goes down here and he starts talking a lot about um, the state of the world at the end times. And it says, and therefore, when in the end... The church shall be suddenly caught up from this. It is said, there shall be tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning, neither shall be. For this is the last contest of the righteous, in which they, when they overcome, they are crowned with incorruption. And he says right here that the church will suddenly be caught up, and then there will be great tribulation. Uh, <clears throat> And it goes on to talk about using the phrase caught up, which is harpazo in the Bible language um, from the King James Version, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, and he quotes that the great tribulation of Matthew 24, 21 uh, would be after the tribulation period. Let's go to Cyprian, A.D. 200 to 250 A.D. He was a bishop of the church in Carthage. Um, one of his works, the Treatises of Cyprian, he wrote in describing the end times great tribulation. We who see that terrible things have begun and know that still more terrible things are imminent may regard it as the greatest advantage to depart from it as quickly as possible. Do you not give God thanks? Do you not congratulate yourself that by an early departure you are taken away and delivered from the shipwrecks and disasters that are imminent? Let us greet the day which assigns each of us to his own home, which snatches us hence, and sets us free from the snares of the world, and restores us to paradise and the kingdom. There's another, that's, that was an A.D. 200, again proclaiming a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, let's look at Ephra Ephraim the Syrian. This is in 306 A.D. to 373 A.D., in his work, On the Last Times, too, he wrote, um, We ought to understand thoroughly, therefore, my brothers, what is imminent or overhanging. Already there have been hunger and plagues, violent movements of nations and signs, and which have been predicted by the Lord. They have already been fulfilled. Uh, let me just keep going down here. Uh, he talks about, with, all, with, that, with the imminent return of, of God coming on, uh, 
why are we worried about the worldly business and the cares of this world and the lusts of this world? Um, believe you, uh, let's see here. It says, believe you me, dearest brother, because the coming advent of the Lord is nigh, because the end of the world is at hand, believe me, because it is the very last time. And it goes on to say, um, or do you not believe unless you see with your eyes? So too, it is the sentence not be fulfilled among you of the prophet who declares, Woe to those who, see, who desire to see the day of the Lord. For all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord lest they see confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of their sins. And so, brothers, most dear to me, it is the eleventh hour and the end of the world comes to the harvest and angels and armed and prepared hold sickles in their hands awaiting the empire of the Lord. And we think that the earth exists with blind infidelity arriving at its downfall early. He says, Ephraim also identifies the Old Testament day of the Lord and the end times great tribulation as the same event. Um, again, that's the, yes, exactly. The rapture is prior to the day of the Lord. And this is a really long article and it has a whole lot of good information in there. Um, it says, in terms of timing of the rapture, the early church fathers placed it before the end times day of the Lord, great tribulation. The writings of early saints in the church are not scripture and should not be treated on the same level of the Bible. These writings also do not prove that the pre-great tribulation rapture or the beginning and end rapture series are correct. Only rightly divided scripture from Bible can determine if a specific belief is accurate or in error. But the writings of church fathers can serve as useful commentaries um, and certainly prove that the rapture doctrine existed well before John Darby and has been part of Christian belief since the earliest days of the apostles. Um, I went through that really fast and uh, it's something you really ought to look at yourself. So check out the link in the description box. Read it for yourself. But... Um, I'm going through that because I'm telling you that all the signs are here, and I believe the rapture is absolutely very, it's imminent, and uh, we need to keep looking up, because Jesus told us, when you see all these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. Um, you know what, I just thought something, I was watching a video by uh, Chuck Missler on YouTube the other night, and he was going through um, Luke 21. And he said something I never noticed before. I never caught. I upset myself for not not having caught this before. But um, he's talking about um, the signs of the last days. Um, oh, let me find it now. Okay, and he's talking about this is this is uh, Luke twenty one, and he's talking about the signs of the last days, similar to Mark or excuse me Matthew twenty four and Mark thirteen. And he says unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. But here's the important. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into the prisons, and be brought before kings and rulers of my name. For my name's sake, and shall turn you, and shall turn to you for a testimony. Do you hear what that said? Before, but before all these things, before the earthquakes and the nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, before all these things, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you. And Christian persecution has been going on the entire life of the church, and it has gotten much worse this century, uh, worse than ever. But. Um, it doesn't mean the church has to be here to be persecuted during the final seven-year period of time. It just doesn't. It does not mean that whatsoever. And that's the first time I ever noticed that phrase after Chuck pointed it out. But before all these, they will lay their hands on you. But we are in the beginning of sorrows right now, where all those signs are happening. In fact, I think we're coming up right on the beginning of the final seven-year period of time, when the Antichrist will confirm the covenant with many, and Daniel's seventieth week will begin. Now because of that, i got to get into a bunch of news stories because there's so much going on. Um, you know, again, there is a one world government and a one world religion forming right before our eyes, 
uh, there's a, we're basically living more and more in a police state, even here in the United States of America. Our rights are being taken away from us, uh, actually at an, at an ever-alarming rate at this point. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about um, some politics here. I saw the Fox News today. Um, you, and this is very interesting. This is not about YouTube. YouTube crackdown. This is Fox News. YouTube crackdown. Dem regulators target online political content. Again, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. What I'm doing here, doing these videos, and talking about the fall of America and the government and, and the corruption in the government and the one world religion and all that, and proclaiming Jesus Christ uh, I, 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 is going to soon be illegal. Here we go. YouTube crackdown. Dem regulators target online political content. The Internet, including sites like YouTube and Drudge Report, has never been subject to federal election regulations, but that could change as some Democrats have their way. The top Democrat on the Federal Election Commission strongly suggested Friday that regulators look at extending their authority to election-themed Internet videos, an area that for years has been largely hands-off for the government. Uh, a statement from Vice Chairwoman Ann Ravel, who is in line to take over the commission next year, prompted Republicans to warn that such a move could threaten the growth and freedom of the Internet itself. I have been warning that my Democratic colleagues are moving to regulate media generally and the Internet specifically for almost a year now, Chairman Lee Goodman told Fox News. And today's statement from the Vice Chair Ravel confirms my, my warnings. <clears throat> Let's see here. Um, let's see. It says, It is really a specter of government review board calling the old Internet daily. Um, I don't know how we could begin to regulate all the hundreds of thousands of political commentaries online. Uh, but again, remember the NSA, they're tracking everything we do online right now. Trust me, they, they know what we're doing. They know what we're saying. They can track it very, very easily. Um, Ducey pointed out the, uh, that the IRS clamped down on conservative and Tea Party groups, arguing that if the rules are changed, the FEC could potentially target one side, depending on which party is in the White House. But here they go, going after, uh, you know, again, I thought we lived in America where we had free speech, but apparently we don't anymore. And they're trying to uh, basically like, um, make it so you can't make political statements on, on the Internet. That's basically what it's boiling down to. Um, so what's that got to do with, uh, well, it's going to lead right to a one-world government. That's what's going to happen. Um, eventually the mark of the beast and the one-world religion. Um, so let's look at another article out of uh, Fox News today. Uh, let's see, let me find it here. Elections can't fix it, Huckabee says. Um, U.S. needs more moral, spiritual awakening. A mere election won't fi fix what's wrong with America, Mike Huckabee said in his opening statement Saturday night. The, gov the governor believes the nation is in need of a moral and spiritual awakening and a good dose of common sense. He pointed to many examples of Christians' religious beliefs being infringed upon while Guantanamo Bay inmates receive special accommodations. Inmates at Gitmo are now complaining that they won't leave their cells if they are being escorted by a woman. Huckabee explained that the inmates already get expensive Muslim-approved meals, arrows in, their cell, arrows in their cells pointing to Mecca, and prayer rugs, plus the suspected terrorists can also keep their beards. The Fort Hood attacker gets to keep his beard, even though it's against military policy, because we don't want to offend his religion. Good God, people, he's a terrorist, said, said Huckabee. While the government makes these accommodations for terrorists, we stomp all over the religious convictions of Americans. Huckabee highlighted a recent story about two ministers in Ohio who were facing great fines or possibly jail time because they don't want to perform same-sex weddings. Muslims don't accept homosexual marriage either. But when have you heard the Human Rights Commission squealing about the Muslims, he asked. Huckabee said that while radical Muslims are committing terror attacks in Canada, Oklahoma, and New York City, the mayor of Houston is ordering pastors to turn over sermons. So where's the Justice Department? Oh, they're making sure Nadal Hassan gets to keep his hairy face, said Huckabee. That is a great 
statement, and that is a great article. And it reminds me of Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Unfortunately, I feel like it's too far gone for that. We are this close to the final seven-year period of time starting. There is still time for personal salvations and personal revivals and hopefully you know, widespread revival in, throughout the people in, in our nation and around the world. But as far as the whole country turning back to God, I just don't see it happening. I think we're too far along and, and, and too close to uh, the one world religion or, and the one world government of the beast. Um, but the, the political na landscape, the political nature is amazing. I'm a PGA golf professional. I was at a meeting today. Over, our, uh, over the weekend, our PGA president, of, the PGA of America president, was relieved of his duties because he sent out a tweet calling a European PGA Tour player a little girl. And he was relieved of his entire P of being the president of the PGA for saying that. Now, whether you think what he said or not is right, I was amazed how not one person at the meeting today would, would say, whatever happened to our freedom of speech? The whole political correctness thing is so... <laughs> it's just so over the top now and that's what's leading to this whole in gospel of inclusion uh tolerance and and uh no more uh well extreme beliefs so to speak and and uh they're compare they're going to make it so you know believing that the bible is the true word of god and jesus christ is the only only way to the father is as extreme a belief in saying as being a radical jihadist who's beheading people that's where this world is heading, and that's why there's going to be, a, again, a one-world government and a one-world religion. We're all part of the same global community, and for the good of common humanity, we've got to pull together and, and, uh, and you know, no more national sovereignty. We're all part of the same global community, and no more exclusive beliefs that your God is the only way. We all, we all worship the same God anyway. That's where it's heading, and that's where it's going. And you can see that what the Dems are trying, Democrats are trying to do to YouTube right now in political speech, what happened with the PJ president this week, um, all of our rights are going away. That leads me to another similar story. This is out of Newsmax. This is kind of an update on uh, a recent story, the recent story about um, the mayor in Houston. Where is that at? All right, Newt Gingrich, Houston subpoenas part of radical plan. Newt Gingrich, Houston pastor subpoenas subpoenas are part of a radical agenda. Houston mayor and East Parker's decision to issue subpoenas for sermons from the city's Christian pastors was for much larger political and constitutional stakes than just to coerce disclosure from the minister, said Newt Gingrich. The mayor of Houston's recent subpoena of sermons by Christian pastors in the country's fourth largest city is a shocking violation of First Amendment rights to free speech and free exercise of religion. There is no clearer violation of First Amendment freedoms than for government officials to attempt to censor religious speech. Uh, he notes that the pastor's attorneys were ready to squash to sue the quash of subpoenas and would have succeeded, but Parker decided to withdraw the demands following protests. The so-called bathroom bill passed in May is Parker's signature initiative and is still being threatened by threats to repeal it through a referendum vote, said Gingrich, calling it part of uh, Parker's radical agenda. In politics, if politicians are not succeeding in their arguments, they change the subject. Mayor Parker apparently is not succeeding in her defense of a law that Opponents claim right creates a right, among other newly created sexual and gender identity rights, for anyone to use public bathrooms of the opposite sex in the name of gender rights equality. Um, if you are a liberal mayor trying to create a new sexual and gender identity rights, there's apparently no better object on which to focus the public than the Christian pastors and their beliefs on gender and sexuality. And as such, Parker is trying to shift the debate from a fight over the merits of her sexual and gender identity agenda 
to a fight over the Christian worldview of sexual ethics. That's exactly what's going on with that, and that's exactly where we're at. And again, this is just more and more um, uh, just things that are turning the public's attention away from Christian, uh, Judeo-Christian ethics and morals toward uh, this all-inclusive and making Christians look extreme in their ways of thinking. Um, and again, we're just we're being led every day toward the one world religion. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's go. Another news story. There is so much to report tonight. So much going on. Uh, this is out of the blaze. The CDC predict that the current infection rate, Ebola could kill up to 1.4 million people in January. Uh, what you might not know is ISIS, the ISIS terrorists, are weaponizing Ebola and attempting to kickstart a plague in the U.S., possibly in the coming weeks. And there's a link on here you can click on. It says click to see the proof. Uh, the death numbers will be much worse than what the CDC is estimating. And when that happens, it will give Obama the perfect excuse to declare a national emergency and suspend, and suspend all of our constitutional rights. It's not just martial law, mass seizure of guns and food. Those are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, again, I'm going to put all of this into the description box. But I've, I've said on numerous occasions, I'm going to say it again, Barack Hussein Obama is the last American president. Um, and, and through some form of whether he is going to suspend the Constitution and stay on as president. I just feel that completely in my heart, and I know a lot of other people are saying the same thing. Um, let's look at another story here out of the blaze. Bonhoeffer author fired up over sermon subpoena controversy. Everyone in America should be freaking out. But no one in America, other than, you know, very, very, very few, seems... Uh, evangelicals and, and uh, the nutcases like me on YouTube are freaking out about this. Everything, everybody else is, you know, whatever, it's yesterday's news, who cares? Um, it says, when Eric Metaxas, author of Bonhoeffer, pastor, martyr, prophet, spy, first read about the Houston city government subpoenaing the sermons of five church pastors, he said he couldn't believe it. This has got to be a joke. This cannot be happening in America. But once he got deeper into the subject, he said, I knew a bold red line had been crossed. If there's ever a time to throw the tea into the harbor, this is it. The subpoenas involve sermons that may focus on homosexuality or Houston's contentious equal rights ordinance supported by Mayor Anise Parker, um, the first openly gay mayor in the U.S., um, and beyond the widespread outrage over what seems like a strike against religious freedom in America, Marta Metaxas says, sees chilling parallels with the social and political climate of the 1930s Germany. That time and place is the backdrop to his best-selling book about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Christian leader who was jailed and later executed for plotting to assassinate Adolf Hitler. It's a shocking thing, he said, of the similarities to what's happening in Houston, adding that everyone in America should be freaking out. If we tolerate this kind of abrogation of religious freedom in this nation... All of our liberties will be unraveled. It is that serious. America needs to wake up. The church especially needs to know that this is a huge trampling of something that the founder said was at the heart of all our liberties. Amen to that. But unfortunately, again, the church is asleep. The church is not paying any attention to current world events as it relates to Bible prophecy. They don't look at the big picture. Um, and obviously the secular world is either completely asleep, or, unfortunately, because we're at the time of the end where the love of many is growing cold and uh, iniquity is abounding, the secular world agrees with what's going on right now. All right. Oh, wow. Uh, Prophecy News Watch today. Here's a little news about uh, what they're doing to kids. ISIS, School of Jihad, trains small children how to behead, 
torture and use AK-47s. Again, that religion of peace, the Muslims. Read the Quran, guys. It's not a religion of peace. Uh, forced viewings of beheadings and torture, training with weapons almost as big as they are, and daily lessons in extremist theology. If you're a, bro a boy growing up in ISIS-controlled territories across Syria and Iraq, the word education means something very different to the rest of the world. Official ISIS media outlets, outlets are circulating videos and images which they claim show life in the school of jihad where children under the age of 10 are encouraged to fire AK-47 rifles and acclimatized to the horrors of war. Uh, as part of a propaganda uh, series, um, the, the, the group's media um, shows, children, shows children appearing in videos that experts say are an attempt to show the utopia of the world under ISIS. <clears throat> One video has been titled on YouTube, Cubs of the, of the Islamic State, um, and it's showing all these young kids and are sure in their faith and in auspices of, the, of ISIS. Uh, it shows the new school of jihad graduates lined up before a st stage, listening to speakers while rows of adults are thought to be their parents can be seen watching on uh, Says children should never be involved in fighting in Syria and Iraq and anywhere else for that matter, even if they volunteer and even if they're acting in auxiliary capacities such as deserve, delivering messages for other uh, non-combat tasks. International law clearly prohibits the deployment of child soldiers and where ISIS have used underage fighters is just one more crime to add to a large crime sheet against them. But in the schools over there, they're all being taught to hate the Jews, hate Israel, hate America, kill the infidel, which is anybody that's not a Muslim. The situation in the world is not going to get any better until Jesus Christ returns. He said it's going to get so bad that if, no, if the days were not shortened, no flesh would be saved. Uh, real quickly... Let's go to the Times of Israel. I'm going to cover a couple of news stories there as well. Um, you know, the Bible says that, the, that Jerusalem will be, will be a burdensome stone. In fact, let's just go there real quick again. Get the scriptural reference real quick. Um, and just go to the news stories. Um, just to show you how it's all coming together every single day, getting closer and closer. Uh, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All the burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Verse 9 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Here is the times of Israel today. Um, EU, and again, look for the European Union to get more and more involved in the peace process. EU seeking Israeli clarification on new settlement homes in Jerusalem. Uh, spokeswoman says body would condemn such an ill-judged and ill-timed decision if the plans went ahead. The EU said Monday it was seeking Israeli clarification of reports it planned to build another 1,000 homes in annexed East Jerusalem, voicing new concern about the peace process. If the reports are confirmed, it will once again, it will call once again into serious question Israel's commitment to a negotiated solution with the Palestinians. The European Union could only condemn such an ill-judged and ill-timed decision if the plans went ahead. We stress that the future development of relations between the EU and Israel will depend on its engagement toward a lasting peace based on a two-state solution. Okay, that's the EU's take on it. Let's go back here now and uh, look at a couple other articles. Uh, Palestinian Prime Minister, or Palestinian PM, visits Temple Mount 
amid unrest. Now, we just read an article about the EU saying that uh, Israel trying to build in, uh, the, in Jerusalem is going to prevent peace from happening. Uh, here we go. Uh, Rami Hamdallah vows that there will not be a Palestinian state without East Jerusalem as its capital. Capital. Uh, I'm just going to read that headline. Um, so there's the PA insisting that that East Jerusalem will be their capital and their the Palestinian state that they're trying to again go to the UN uh, and have the UN vote to make Israel. Give them the two-state solution. Give them the land. Um, now, what's Benjamin Netanyahu got to say about this? Netanyahu promises to keep building in Jerusalem. At Knesset opening, Prime Minister battles hecklers, declares Israel has same right to construction and capital as do the French in Paris. And he's right. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at Monday's opening of the Knesset Winter Session defended Israel's right to build in Jerusalem and criticized the Palestinians for making unreasonable demands for peace. <clears throat> Netanyahu plowed ahead even though he's being interrupted um, uh, during his speech uh, and heckled, declaring that Israel has the same right to build in Jerusalem as other nations do in their own capital cities, and there is a wide consensus in Israel to continue building throughout the city, as every government has done since Israel captured East Jerusalem in the 1967 war. There is a wide agreement among the public that Israel has the full right to build the Jewish neighborhoods of Jerusalem, the Prime Minister said. Every Israeli government in the last 50 years did that, and it is also clear to the Palestinians that those places will stay under Israeli control in any mutual agreement. The French build in Paris, the English build in London, the Israelis build in Jerusalem. Should we tell Jews not to live in Jerusalem because it will stir things up? Netanyahu asked. Israelis pray for, pray for next year in the rebuilt Jerusalem, he continued. And you tell us not to build in Jerusalem? We are building, just like we built since the start of the state. On that, there needs to be a clear agreement. Building is the natural answer to those who want to move Remove us from our land. They want death, and we are building life. All right, I will post this into the description box. Uh, actually, let me read this real quick. Uh, Netanyahu panned the Palestinian for making demands on Israel without offering anything in return. The Palestinians demand from us the establishment of a Palestinian state without peace or security. They demand withdrawal, the absorption of refugees, and the division of Jerusalem. They aren't prepared to agree to the most basic conditions of peace between two peoples. Mutual recognition. Israel will not agree to a Palestinian state without a true peace agreement. An agreement that will recognize Israel as a state of the Jewish people and that will include long-term, eventually a seven-year agreement, I guarantee you that. That's what the Bible says. Long-term and concrete security arrangements on the ground that enables Israel to defend herself with her own might against any threat. Um, and then, then this article goes in and talks about Iran and, and nuclear weapons and how, how close they are to that. It's amazing this world is on fire. You can just you just get the feeling that something major is about to happen. And and uh, praise God, I believe the rapture is one of those things that's about to happen. Jesus Christ told us all the signs to look for that would signal his near return. And they are all here. And they are escalating at an ever-increasing rate. It is vital to make sure you are ready. If you do not know Jesus Christ is your Savior, if you have not made that commitment to Him, and you don't have the inner peace that comes from being a new creation in Christ, if you do, do not know for sure that you, are, if you died today, that you are going to heaven, today is a day of salvation. Uh, yesterday, a Cardinal, St. Louis Cardinal baseball player, 22 years old, just last week, hit a home run in the playoffs. Yesterday, he was at home in the Dominican Republic, and he and his girlfriend were, ki were killed in a car accident. No one is guaranteed tomorrow. Make sure you are ready in case that happens. Everybody needs to keep looking up. All the signs are here, and make sure you're ready. God bless everyone.